Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for this webinar, which has been hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. Uh, my name is Amy Fawcett, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb within AHDB. So I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on contagious ovine digital dermatitis, or COD, in sheep. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Joseph Angel, who's a vet with uh, Wern Vets in North Wales and also a researcher at the University of Liverpool. Um, so without further delay, I'll hand you over to Joseph. Thanks very much, Amy. Well, welcome. Um, as Amy said, my name's Joe Angel. I now work at Wern Veterinary Surgeons in North Wales, uh, and I have an honorary position at University of Liverpool, um, where much of the research uh, that I'm going to talk to you about this evening was carried out. I must just say at this stage, um, the research was funded uh, primarily by uh, the British Veterinary Association, but also um, uh, we received substantial support from AHDB Beef and Lamb and uh, Hubby Cucumry uh, in Wales as well. So I'm going to talk to you about this disease, contagious bovine digital dermatitis or COD, and try and update you on the, on the, uh, the latest advice. In this talk I'm going to go through the diagnosis of the disease, in particular how it's different to foot rot. Um, we know from several surveys that lots of farmers and indeed lots of vets uh, misdiagnose cod as foot rot. I'm going to go through um, treatment of cases, so treatment of individual sheep with cod, and also try and provide you with the up-to-date advice on how to prevent and control cod on your farms. So first of all, what is cod? Well, it's not a fish. Uh, everyone says, are you working on fish? Uh, no, it's not a fish. Um, and the easiest way to describe what cod is is to show you, is to talk to you about what foot rot is briefly and then show you how cod is different. So foot rot, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, you can see in this picture here, this is a classic foot rot. And on this side, you can see a picture of scald. And a lot of the um, recent research work over the last 15, 20 years has shown essentially that scald and foot rot can now be considered the same disease, but two ends of a spectrum. So if you like, scald is an early foot rot, and foot rot is a late or a chronic scald. And they're both caused by this bug here, Dichylobacter nodosus. That's not that important, although it's only important because it's different to what causes cod. So scald starts in the piece of skin here between the two uh, parts of the hoof between the two digits. We call this skin the interdigital space. Um, and the bacteria grows here and then it sort of works its way up the inside of the foot and onto the sole until you end up with this classic foot rot picture here. Um, so cod is different in that it starts here on the front of the foot and it specifically targets the area where the skin stops and it joins the hoof horn. So we call this area the coronary band. Um, and you can see here I've actually had to part the hair to show this, this early cod lesion uh, in order to, to be able to find it. And these sheep with this um, size lesion and are very hard to find. Uh, they often don't show lameness. So they're difficult to, to pick out of a flock. And the only way really to find them is to turn sheep over and look for them. And that becomes important later on. So you can see here this one's sort of red and pink uh, and looks a bit like an ulcer. And this is another case here where it's sort of more white and it sticks out a bit. We call this proliferative. Um, and I've actually had to trim the hair there to see it. So these are hard to find. And, and these are early cod lesions. And this is how it starts specifically here at the coronary band. Then there's the disease advances, it underruns the hoof horn, and you can see here I've had to sort of tweeze the hoof horn down, and if I let go with the hoof trimmers there, this horn pings back and it, it just sort of sits along here. Um, so the bug has started here and then it's, it's kind of tunneled under the hoof horn, it's actually splitting the horn, um, and it's starting to shell out the hoof. And then as, as the disease progresses, you can actually lose the whole hoof horn. Um, and you're left with this sort of bloody stump at the end. 
the hoof horn can then regrow if it's treated properly uh, and and the sheep's given a chance to heal. So this picture, this is the unaffected side, this is the healthy side, uh, and this was the affected side. So you can see the horn has regrown, but it leaves the sheep deformed. So this digit is shorter than this one, and it's wider, and you often get these sort of uh, circumferential creases around the foot, giving it this knobbly, diseased appearance. And actually these sheep, even though they've healed, can remain lame for some time afterwards. Uh, and we've actually taken x-rays of some of these sheep and shown that actually the, the bone on the inside can be uh, eaten away as well. So um, even if you get them better, some of these can remain lame afterwards. So this slide isn't just a mess although that's what it looks like. It's actually a really high-powered microscope slide. And what I want, why I wanted to show you this is we've stained it with a special stain. And in it, I don't know if you can see these little black, they look like wiggly worms. They're sort of, what they are is actual spiral-shaped bacteria. And these are the bacteria that are causing this disease. They're different to the foot rot bacteria. They're called treponemes. And they're actually the same bacteria as cause a whole range of disease syndromes. Um, most notable is um, digital dermatitis in cattle, but we also now see a, a very severe form of lameness in goats, which we find these bacteria in, uh, and also in wild elk in America. Um, we've also started to find them in pig tail biting uh, wounds and ear biting wounds so they're beginning to crop up everywhere and wherever we find them we find really severe nasty disease so that's what it looks like and that's how it's different to foot rot but as farmers what's important to you is is what you can do about it and uh, <clears throat> before I go through this slide really I, I would say if, if you're unsure of your diagnosis I'd really encourage you to take photographs or take an affected individual to your vet and encourage them to look at it and uh, to get an accurate diagnosis. If, you, if you're trying to treat it as foot rot, you're, you're likely to struggle uh, and, uh, and, and get problems uh, and uh, struggle to get on top of it. When I go to a farm, I often want to see several sheep with cod because you, you, you know I've got a load of pictures there that I've taken uh, from thousands of sheep uh, and it's and it's taken me a long time to get good pictures to put in talks um, so often when I go to a farm that nothing looks quite like the picture and you're trying to decide is there cod here is there just foot rot here so having a look at a few sheep with cod can be useful in order to be sure of your diagnosis so what can we do about it well the first thing is um, there's been two surveys done uh, over the last uh, six or seven years and both of those surveys have showed there's about 50% of farms with cod so that means there's 50% of farms that haven't got cod um, we suspect it's probably slightly less than that and so as I said before there is some difficulty with recognizing the disease um, but I do know there are farms without cod so the so first of all it's important to <clears throat> to keep it out and in these surveys, when we ask farmers, how did cod arrive on your farm? Uh, a lot of people say they don't know how it arrived. Um, but those that do know often say they can identify that it came onto their farm through the purchase of a sheep with an infection, often a ram. So that's what farmers are telling us, that that's the main way that uh, cod can come onto a farm. So as a consequence of that, if you're running a closed flock, and it's certainly different for people who are buying and selling stores on, on short term, but if you're running a closed flock and, and you're, you're buying maybe some ewe lamb replacements or, or maybe just rams, we'd recommend that at purchase you would turn over all your sheep on entry and look for those early cod lesions. If you remember that early cod lesion at the beginning where it had to part the hair to show it, those sheep are difficult to find and they're, uh, they're often not lame as well so you can't rely on them being lame to uh, to show you there's a problem if you buy one of those in and it progresses and spreads the disease to other sheep 
then uh, it can be too late and you can end up with um, an outbreak on your farm. So I would recommend you turn over all sheep on entry. It doesn't take that long to do and look at every foot. Um, there's also other ways that um, disease can be spread and certainly uh, we know of, of cases where fences have been not up to scratch and uh, lambs or, or sheep with card have, have crossed a fence and that's led to the introduction into uh, neighbouring farms and there's also can be issues with grazing commons where uh, if, if one farm's particularly got a, an issue with cod it, it can then transfer on a common and we've got experience of both those those two situations. So think about your biosecurity on a farm. I know on many extensive farms that's that could be really difficult to achieve uh, but do your best to do it and um, and keep chipping away at that to, to improve biosecurity. So that's the first point. We've recently um, done a study where we showed that uh, these treponemes can survive on hoof knives. So we, what we did is just swab the blade of some hoof knives after, after they'd been used to trim some sheep with cod and then my colleagues were able to grow those bacteria in the, in the laboratory and, and show that they can survive on those hoof knives. And some, there's been some other groups working on this disease and um, particularly in uh, the Netherlands they've shown that these bacteria can survive in slurry for a few days um, and we've recently uh, done a study where we were able to grow them off uh, the gloves of hands used to handle feet like this. So we handled some feet, we swabbed our gloves and showed that the bacteria could survive on the gloves. We then took the gloves off and left them in the laboratory for several days and swabbed them every day until we couldn't get a positive result. And we were able to show that uh, the treponemes could survive on those glove, gloves for, for three days in the air. So if you can imagine on some hoof clippings or whoop, or in the or in the muck, um, then uh, these treponemes could potentially survive longer. So it's it's really important to think about a what you do with your pens after using them, or uh, and a what you do with any hoof clippings that you might uh, generate. Um, we did show also in this glove study that it was very easy to kill the bacteria. So we tried a number of disinfectants commonly available and we even used uh, antibacterial hand soap that you can purchase from a supermarket and we were able to show that uh, virtually all the bacteria were removed with all those products. So simple cleaning and disinfection will go a long way to remove the bacteria from contaminated surfaces. So I think this is this is sort of really important when looking at your farm system to sort of stand back and think right where are the the areas of risk and there was a really good example of a farm I went to and we'd managed to eliminate cod from that farm and get rid of all disease and he had another flock of sheep kept elsewhere which still had cod and he sheared those sheep with cod in some pens and then the next day he brought in some other sheep from his cod free flock into the same pens and two weeks later he started with a cod outbreak in those those sheep so it shows how easily how easy it is to spread disease from one group to another just through um, poor biosecurity so there's lots every farm's different and, and it's difficult to sort of make hard and fast rules you should use this or you should do that but what I would encourage you to do is, is have a conversation with your vet or your farm advisor and work out um, the best way to uh, reduce the spread of disease with the particular system you've got. So we're going to talk a bit more about control. Um, it is possible to eliminate disease from flocks. We don't think it's that possible to do that with foot rot, although there are some flocks that claim to not have foot rot. Uh, but it certainly is possible to eliminate cod. Some flocks it's just very difficult to, to be able to do this with the management they've got and so it may be that uh, control is more of the way forward. So in, in um, several studies now we've shown that uh, for individual sheep 
the biggest risk factor for cod is foot rot. Um, and we've also shown that if you uh, work at reducing foot rot, then you also have an effect on reducing cod. We're not quite sure why this is, but what we think is is that the the bug that causes foot rot, Dicylobacter nodosus, we think that essentially can colonize the skin on its own and damage the skin and essentially make a weakness, allowing the treponemes to come in secondarily and, and cause cod afterwards. So the strongest study that showed this effect was um, where we actually vaccinated sheep using the foot rot vaccine that's available and we actually showed that this was a this was a a farm that had foot rot and cod in the in the sheep and we vaccinated half the sheep with foot rot with the foot vax and the other half we left alone and we actually showed that in the sheep that received the vaccine they had less foot rot by about 60% compared to the other unvaccinated sheep but they also had less cod by about 32% and we went away and tested the vaccine to make sure that there wasn't any of the cod bacteria in the vaccine um, and to make sure we weren't inadvertently vaccinating them against cod. Uh, and you'll be pleased to know it, it has got in it what it says on the tin. It has only got the uh, foot rot um, bit in the vaccine. So we think the reason this reduced the amount of cod is essentially we just reduced the amount of foot rot and that therefore reduced the amount of cod subsequently. So the first thing you can do if you've got cod on your farm and you want to try and get on top of it is to look at your foot rot control and if that's not up to scratch then I would I would start there. Um, so I know farmers hate graphs and, and you'll be pleased to know I've not got many graphs to show you uh, but this is from, a, from another study where we followed six farms through over uh, just over a year and what we did is we measured the amount of cod um, every two months on those farms by turning over all the sheep on those farms and what we're showing here is actually um, that the amount of cod seems to go up in late summer early autumn then it came down over the winter and it went up in the spring and then down again and then we had to stop the study but it seems to be going up again there and um, we don't fully know and understand all of these uh, dynamics there uh, but I think the spring peak is fairly easy to um, to understand it's associated with lambing so sheep are brought together for lambing which increases the opportunity for disease to spread um, and then I think a similar thing is happening in the late summer, early autumn, in that we've got more sheep around, you've got all the ewes, all the rams, and quite possibly a lot of lambs still, and also at their, their heaviest weights. But if we actually use those same data and look for how much foot rot there is, and we overlay the graphs, so in, in this graph we've got the, the blue line is, is the cod graph I showed you before, and then what I've done is overlay a foot rot graph for it, Actually, we get the same peaks here, roughly. So we've got a peak here for foot rot coinciding with a peak for cod, and a peak here for foot rot coinciding with a peak for cod. And this is very typical for foot rot in that you get um, a seasonal increase over the summer with warm and wet conditions. Um, so it may be that actually the, the cod increases we're seeing are actually as a result of the foot rot. Um, so this is just sort of further evidence to reiterate that, um, that that cod and foot rot are sort of strongly linked together. So I haven't time to go into all the ins and outs of how to control foot rot. Um, I would highlight to you the five point plan for foot rot which has been sort of taken up by the, in, the industry across the UK. Um, the five points there are on, on your screens and I would say by far in a way the most important part of that five point plan is to treat early. Um, if you catch lame sheep early and treat those effective in, affected individuals effectively, you not only get that sheep better in producing well, but actually you reduce the amount of spread 
she can cause to to other individuals. You've got to imagine that every time she takes a step, that leaves a little deposit of bacteria on the ground, which uh, which can potentially infect some other sheep. If you want more information on that, I'd encourage you to look at the HDB uh, Better Returns program resources. There's the uh, lameness bulletin there, which has got up-to-date information on controlling foot rot. There's also quite a lot of information on the Warwick University uh, website as well. They've done quite a lot of the recent work on that. Um, but what can we do about treating individuals with COD? So this is a sheep that's got COD um, and has got the disease. What do we do with, with, with her? Well, at the, uh, actually, there's not that many studies done on it. We're aware of three well-designed studies, and I've, I've sort of bullet-pointed the results of them there on your screen. So in the first study, um, we compared uh, foot bathing in chlortetracycline, so that's an antibiotic, and we we stood we we stood those sheep in that foot bath for 15 minutes, and we did that for three consecutive days. So not that practical, I would agree. Um, but this was the outcome. So, and for those sheep in that study, only only 53% of them, only about half of them, got better. So, not not a great result. However, in that same study, when we add in a long-acting amoxicillin injection together with this foot bathing in chlortetracycline, we get about a 70 to 80% cure rate of a single jab. So, it's long-acting. It lasts about two to three days. Um, so you get about a 70 to 80 percent cure rate of the long-acting amoxicillin together with the foot bathing. And actually, this study has been repeated where they've used just the long-acting amoxicillin, and, and you get about a 70 percent cure rate in that case. So the chlortetracycline doesn't seem to be adding much in that case. So you get about three quarters of them better off a single jab of long-acting amoxicillin. And certainly we find that if you repeat that injection two to three days later, you get much nearer 90 to 100% cure rate. So a lot of farms, that is a practical approach using long-acting amoxicillin. It's something you, you can have prescribed by your, by your vet. And if you can isolate sheep either in a lame field or a lame pen, you can sort of have a fairly basic system where you just bring in whatever is in that field or pen for injection every two days until things are better. And that can keep things simple. We also did a, a small study as part of another project where we looked at using this drug tilmycosin. It's been around for quite a long time. And um, we gave two injections of this two weeks apart, and that led to 100% cure rate. This drug is vet-only administration. Um, so it's not practical for um, some situations, but if you've got an outbreak and it's cost-effective to have your vet out to deal with that, then uh, that's another option for you, or, or another option would be to take a trailer load of affected sheep to the vet for treatment. Um, so that's all the, inf all the robust information we have. There's lots of other anecdotes in the literature. Um, Lots of people saying, I've tried this, I've tried that, but in terms of the actual science and what's been robustly studied uh, and therefore what we can advise you, uh, that's the, the current information. So as a, you know, as a sort of summary of that, there's, there's no right or wrong approach, uh, and I you know, use slightly different approaches on different farms depending on the, the particular situation and... Um, management structures and policies that, that are in place. I would encourage you to have a conversation with your vet as to which is the best product for you to use and um, and then on how to use it. Uh, certainly if you're a very extensive hill flock you might have a different set of difficulties to deal with compared to a more intensive uh, sort of pasture grazed uh, lowland, lowland flock. And I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions on this, this at the end. This often generates quite a lot of questions as to as people trying to get their head around what to do in their situation. I'm going to treat, talk to you now about treating the whole flock 
with antibiotics. <clears throat> so this sort of long, incomprehensible bullet point here, whole flock metaphylactic tilmycosin to eliminate cod. What does that mean? Well, it means giving all the flock an injection of an antibiotic in order to try and get rid of all the disease from a flock. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we did a study on this uh, and then talk to you about the results of that study and, and whether this is something practical to take forward. So this sort of whole flock treatment all at one go or, or blanket treatment as, as some people call it, uh, we were aware of was being done quite widely in the industry um, but you'll all be aware I'm sure of of uh, sort of nas national and global concern over widespread use of antibiotics and this this drug tilmycosin is is in this class of antibiotics called macrolides and these have been highlighted as um, ones that we're worried about and to be concerned about um, not only as part of the UK but as also part of the the wider global community so people are, are, are twitchy about um, about farmers using these drugs uh, in particular. However, um, if you were able to eliminate all disease from the farm, get rid of all the cod and it, it stayed away for forever, then you know maybe you would actually use less antibiotic over over the long term period. Um, you know, and so there was an argument for even from an antibiotic resistance point of view that you might actually use less antibiotics overall. So before we embarked on this study we we did a pilot study using, um, well first of all we did a laboratory study where we examined uh, 10 different antibiotics in the, in the lab and uh, and from there we selected tilmycosin from that study as being one that had um, good efficacy against these bacteria in the lab. We then did a pilot study where we tried out this drug in sheep with cod and we're able to ach achieve this 100% clinical cure and this is where we gave a jab of tilmycosin and then repeated that two weeks later as I mentioned before and so and um, we were able to achieve 100% uh, clinical cure with that so it was a good candidate to take forward to uh, more robust clinical trials so this looks a very busy slide and I'll just talk you through it but it's it was quite a complicated study design, but it's really important that you, ha you understand how the study design worked in order to see how we come to the conclusions at the end. So we worked out that we needed 30 flocks in our study and we randomly allocated them so they couldn't choose. We randomly allocated the flocks uh, to either just carry on doing, this, this means treatment as usual, so just carry on doing whatever they were doing or they were randomly allocated to the intervention and I'll go through this intervention in a bit more detail. This is the whole flock treatment bit. For both groups of sheep, those in the control group if you will, the treatment as usual group, um, we visited all the sheep on one day during the winter and we turned over all the sheep and documented all everything to do with the uh, the feet that you could possibly imagine but specifically focusing on cod. Because there's no best practice for um, treating individuals with cod we just allowed these farmers to just carry on doing treatment as usual so treating the sheep as they'd always done and as discussed with their veterinary surgeon using the, the products that had been prescribed for them. Then in the intervention group we did exactly the same, turn over all the sheep on, in the flock on one day, document all the foot lesions and then carried out the intervention which is on a, another slide. We then left the farms alone except for sort of maintaining uh, telephone contact and then we re-examined all the sheep exactly one year later so we turned them all over again and uh, re-documented all, all the uh, the foot lesion. So we're able to say how much cod is there at the beginning and how much cod is there a year later and then compare the number of farms with cod in both groups. Due to various things we lost a number of farms on the way um, due to all sorts of uh, personal difficulties so we ended up with 11 control farms and 13 intervention farms at the end. 
So just to reiterate, we examined all the sheep on one day and we turn, turn them all over and examine all the feet. We made use of this turnover crate in order to be able to document all this properly. So this is the this is this schematic is to uh, help you understand the intervention. So on day one in the intervention farms, all sheep received a single jab of tilmicosin at the uh, at the high dose rate uh, under the skin. And this square is meant to be a pen. All the sheep as you can see they're coming through that system we're able to identify those with cod any sheep with a cod lesion is then isolated in this pen and two weeks later we re revisited the farms and they gave those sheep a second jab of tilmicosin they were then further isolated for another two weeks so these sheep with cod were isolated for a full month having received two jabs of tilmicosin in addition to this we wanted to do a belt and braces approach. We said to the farmers, um, if you buy any sheep in during the year, phone us when you buy them, isolate them on arrival to the farm and we'll turn up within 24 hours and, and inject them in the same way um, in order to, to ensure that, if you, that they don't bring any disease onto the farm as well. So we thought if we're going to try and do this, we're going to do it properly. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, the size of the study. So we had 15 control farms, 15 intervention farms enrolled at the beginning, and we had th three and a half thousand sheep in the control group and four and a half thousand sheep in the intervention group. Various farms dropped out, but by the end of the study, farmers always try and find you more sheep. We had about just over 4,000 sheep in the uh, control farms and just over 5,000 in the intervention group. So as I said in the analysis we had 11 control farms and 13 intervention farms. So this is the uh, last graph you'll be pleased to know and this is the results of the study with regard to COD. So what we've got here is the flock number across the bottom. So each of these numbers represents a single farm. And in the blue dots are how much disease there is, the percentage of sheep with disease at the beginning of the study and then the red squares are how much disease there is at the end of the study. Then we've got the control flocks here and the intervention flocks here and you need to remember that the study objective was can we get rid of disease from these farms. So you can see, hopefully you can see that six farms in the intervention group eliminated disease and one farm eliminated disease out of the control group. Um, so the results of this are essentially the clinical elimination of COD on affected farms is possible for a year but it's got a high failure rate. In our study um, 7 out of the 13 intervention farms it didn't work on uh, so that's, that's more than half and actually when you compare the percentages between the intervention farms and the control farms there's no statistical difference. So interestingly because we looked at all foot lesions we were also able to show that no farms uh, eliminated foot rot at all so that survived on on all the farms. So sort of you know what can we do with this data? This is real data it's never straightforward you know and should we be doing whole flock treatment? Well as I said before Macrolides, this, is, this antibiotic falls into this class. Macrolides are critically important for human medicine. That's a statement made by the World Health Organization and has been taken up by countries worldwide. And so we need to sort of hold that in one hand. In our study, there was a high failure rate. So we were only successful on six out of 13 farms. So that is seven out of 13 farms it didn't work on. Lots of people ask, well, why do you think it didn't work? We're not sure. It's really difficult to drill down completely why that, that didn't work. I suppose there are a number of possibilities. One, we never eliminated it in the first place, and it just grumbled on in the flock. Two, we eliminated disease, and then sheep were reinfected, and they could have been reinfected from some sort of reservoir of bacteria on the farm somewhere, maybe some dirty pens, maybe who knows. Um, 
asking questions on those farms there were biosecurity issues uh, on, on most of them which comes back to uh, the point I mentioned earlier about looking after fences and thinking about where sheep are grazing and whether there's any disease risks to where you're grazing your sheep. And there's also a high cost associated with this so we asked uh, veterinary practice to cost this out for us uh, who do a lot of sheep work and they estimated it would cost about four pound a ewe so if it was going to work it needed to work well uh, in order to be able to justify such a cost and therefore with all those things on balance and particularly the uh, the concerns over antibiotic use overall uh, whole flock metaphylactic treatment for cod cannot be recommended it doesn't work well enough and we've got these concerns over this antibiotic and again there is there's a high cost to this approach and this would sort of I think stand out true for lots of the other macrolide antibiotics that are for sale out there so okay what you know what else can we do and, I, and I'm just going to quickly skip back to this slide I want to just briefly talk about flock 25 to me he was the most interesting flock in this study he um, he was able to eliminate disease from his farm altogether without our help if you like it and when I first visited him some years before the study started he had a he had quite a, a major problem with both foot rot and cod he had certainly about 30 percent of his flock lame with with something um, and what we did is we instigated a foot rot control program first so we, we implemented the five point plan and were able to get on on top of his foot rot and then he just doggedly went at um, identifying lame sheep he identified them early anything with a foot lesion was isolated and then he treated them appropriately until they until they were better and he used a long acting amoxicillin injection and he just quietly got on with that and by the end of this study he'd eliminated disease but what was interesting is I saw him some weeks ago again and um, he said we've not had any card for ages and he says I've just bought some ewe lambs because they were cheap and he says you'll never guess what he says I did isolate them in a field and after two weeks there's a there's at least 10 percent of them hopping about and, they, and they've got cod so he was scared stiff of reintroducing it to his flock and I think it shows even on farms where management and, and knowledge is, is right up there it, it's it's easy to make mistakes with particularly with regards to to biosecurity so so I'd encourage you to involve your vet for a, a sort of holistic approach to lameness management and control particularly because foot rot and cod interact so well often things you'll do for foot rot will help you control cod but certainly if you're trying to treat cod as foot rot you will you'll run into trouble and, and struggle and become frustrated if you if if you haven't got a vet who's um, willing to engage with sheep try and find one who is there's lots of really good sheep vets around I've just come back from an international conference of sheep vets and everyone is um, keen and excited to be working on lameness control so find yourself a good sheep vet and, and engage their services appropriately in order to get this disease and indeed foot rot managed well on your farm I can't emphasize enough how important it's going to be to adopt good biosecurity measures and this is going to become even more important as we move forward in a world where um, control of disease particularly using antibiotics is, is going to become less and less uh, uh, favorable I'd really encourage you to deal with foot rot uh, promptly if not already doing so it's it's not difficult nowadays to be able to keep foot rot down to under 2% on most farms and that's certainly the target that's been set uh, from on high in order to uh, in order for um, sheep farmers to be, to be aiming for and so if you if that's an issue on your farm I would again encourage you to um, to look at that um, so what can you know what can we do um, on your farm if you've got lame sheep I would just encourage you to turn them make a diagnosis isolate them if you can if possible I know that's not always possible on farms but do look at ways of doing that uh, and then treat affected individuals 
with an appropriate product and that may vary um, from farm to farm depending on, on your system and uh, what you have available. 